Well, so, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed regrets. Yes, we came, <laughs> we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. <laughs> if you ask many people what actually happened in Libya around 2011, or if anything happened at all, many will probably say they have no clue. If you mention the name Gaddafi, that might get some people's recognition. But few people, at least inside the United States, know much more than that. And even many of those that do are wrong when it comes to the actual details. Of course, the main reason what happened in Libya is so little understood is, unlike the quagmires in Afghanistan and Iraq, once Libya was bombed, we just left. Libya was an embarrassment we could put behind us as America wasn't affected by the results, at least in any obvious ways. But Libya very much was affected by the results. In fact, no country has ever been so totally destroyed by the West's actions with so little effort as in Libya. Libya today is a failed state. But how did it come to this? Who's at fault? And who really is Muammar Gaddafi? To start, we have to go back, all the way back to the year 1969. Coming to power in a revolution in 1969, Few might have guessed Muammar Gaddafi, born to a poor family in the deserts of Tripolitania, would go on to become one of the longest ruling leaders in Africa and the world. Growing up in America, Gaddafi had always been a boogeyman for me, a monster. And with his villainous sort of swagger and that intimidating name, he fit the bill. Of course, few in the West probably know that by the 21st century, Libya had free housing, free healthcare, and free education. Of course, while there were restrictions on things like free speech and free elections, these same restrictions were what brought stability and wealth to Libya. Gaddafi certainly was an authoritarian dictator in that he had more power than anyone else in his country. But what all of the politicians leave out when they talk about freedom and democracy is that as a result of the devastations of imperialism from the same countries that criticize Africa's lack of proper democracy, every single so-called democracy in most of the global south is rife with corruption and election meddling. Yes, strongman authoritarian regimes are usually very, very bad for a country, but in rare cases, like that of someone such as Gaddafi, the strongman cared about more than just exploiting the country for everything it was worth. Libya in the 2000s was arguably the most prosperous major nation in the continent, if not the most prosperous nation in Africa's modern history. Of course, given Gaddafi's desire to create a united Middle East that didn't have to bow to Western influence, even through military force if necessary, Gaddafi was never on good terms with the West. Reagan even bombed Libya in 1985 after accusing the country, without evidence, of responsibility for a bombing in Germany. Around 100 people were killed, and many more injured in the attack, including two of Gaddafi's sons. Under the increasing realization of the danger of openly opposing a country as strong as the US, Gaddafi worked to stabilize his relationship with the West in the 90s and the early 2000s. But by the late 2000s, his welcome was increasingly wearing out. Particularly disturbing to the West was that Gaddafi wanted to move from the dollar to African dinar using his large reserves of gold and silver. If another currency became dominant in the region, this could heavily damage Western influence there. None of this is conspiratorial. An email sent during the Arab Spring uprising in Libya to the at times Secretary of State Hillary Clinton from her advisor Sidney Blumenthal with the subject title France's Client and Gaddafi's Gold can be found right now on the State Department website and shows that their intentions all along were to defeat Gaddafi in order to prevent Libya from growing more powerful. Up until 2011, though, the West had never really found a good enough excuse to take Gaddafi out. But their time finally came during the Arab Spring, a series of uprisings against governments across the Middle East. Capitalizing on the movement, armed rebels rose up around the country. 
and Libya proceeded to start to put down these uprisings. The West quickly used this as a perfect opportunity to condemn Libya and Gaddafi's authoritarian rule, even though they were and still are allies with extremely authoritarian countries like Saudi Arabia, who also happened to be far more willing to share their vast oil reserves with the West than Libya was. Gaddafi's relationship with the West had been slowly improving over time thanks to certain economic concessions and the dismantling of Libya's nuclear program. But now, all of a sudden, the media began to run stories at a rapid pace about Gaddafi's brutal torture dungeons, or how helicopters were firing on unarmed civilian protesters, or that Gaddafi was using mercenaries from other countries. All claims that Amnesty International either could find no evidence for, or later debunked as lies. The media also portrayed most of the people that rose against Gaddafi as peaceful protesters from all walks of life in Libya, and simply fighting for freedom and human rights. According to a report released in 2016, however, this is all a lie. The rebels in actuality, rather than some spontaneous movement of the working class, were found by the report to be composed mainly of the middle and upper class, angry that their property had been seized in the revolution decades ago, as well as far-right Islamists, including Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Angry that Gaddafi, who was a devout Muslim, was still not quite repressive enough in his interpretation of Islam. The biggest news that came out of Libya was a mass rape campaigns carried out by Gaddafi's troops with the use of Viagra, and which Gaddafi was allegedly distributing to them for that purpose. The story, which received endless coverage in Western media, was reportedly backed up by a questionnaire conducted by a psychologist named Seham Sargiwa of 60,000 refugees in which 295 people responded saying they had been raped. Especially damning were claims from Dr. Saham that she had interviewed female members of Gaddafi's armed guard that were systematically raped by Gaddafi and his sons themselves. Sergiwa's claims quickly began to fall apart on further inspection. Investigations by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the UN were all unable to find any evidence of mass rape. When Amnesty International contacted Sergiwa, to speak with her personally, it turned out she hadn't kept the contact information of a single person she'd interviewed, nor a single one of the supposed 60,000 questionnaires she'd handed out. What is particularly interesting is the fact that Sergiba was in fact one of the first and most vocal protesters against Gaddafi's government during the Arab Spring. Ultimately, it's almost certain that Sergiba lied in part or completely about her claims. Huberman suggests that these countless demonizations of Libya and Gaddafi, which were used to justify the intervention, ended up discouraging efforts to accept a ceasefire and negotiated settlement, turning a humanitarian intervention into a dedicated regime change. But these are all more likely just excuses to help manufacture consent. Regardless of how many lies were told about Libya or not, it was about regime change from the very beginning. After decades of stiff tensions, the West knew that negotiations with Gaddafi would never be enough. He was an enemy that had to be removed at all costs. And so the so-called intervention in Libya was launched. The former president of Egypt, Abdel Nasser, had once said Gaddafi was a nice boy, but terribly naive. And Gaddafi was naive. He was naive to think that he could actually truly make the Middle East independent from the West. And he was even naive enough to think that Obama, as a black man, might sympathize with his situation more than most. As such, he had not fully prepared his military to properly retaliate against a U.S. attack, which he had not expected. Libya's military defenses were devastated in the bombings, and Gaddafi's strongholds were destroyed one by one. Finally, after being on the run for several months, Gaddafi's convoy was disabled by a NATO strike. Gaddafi was captured by rebels, ainly raped with a bayonet, and shot in the head. With no real government put in place to take over, Libya quickly descended even further into a decades-long civil war that left over 100,000 people dead, and which has only just recently gone into a ceasefire that will likely not hold forever. And that's how today Libya is a failed state. In a matter of months, in the name of democracy and freedom, the most stable and most relatively prosperous major country in Africa was reduced to one of the least stable and least prosperous. Someone said, 
Uh, there were things I could see from here that I couldn't see from there when he became prime minister. What, what's the biggest takeaway for you? I'll, I'll give you a, an example of a lesson I had to learn that, that still has you know, uh, ramifications to this day. Uh, and that is uh, uh, our participation in the coalition that overthrew uh, Gaddafi in Libya. Um, I absolutely believe that it was the right thing to do. Uh, when people say, look at the chaos, should have let Gaddafi stay there, they forget that uh, the Arab Spring had come full force to Libya. And had we not uh, intervened, it's likely that Libya would be Syria, right? Um, because Gaddafi was not going to be able to contain what had been unleashed there. And so there'd be more death, more disruption, more destruction. But what is also true is, is that um, I think we underestimated, our European partners underestimated, the need to come in full force. If you're going to do this, then it's the day after Gaddafi's gone. When everybody's feeling good, and everybody's holding up posters saying, thank you, America. At that moment, there has to be a much more aggressive effort to rebuild societies that didn't have any civic traditions. Right? You've had a despot for uh, 40 years in place. But there are no traditions there to build on. Obama is lying when he says that Libya would have turned into another Syrian civil war if NATO hadn't intervened. The reason the West intervened so hastily was because Gaddafi was about to win and restore control over the country. That's why there was only a bombing campaign rather than a full-scale invasion. They didn't have the time to ensure they could make Libya into just another source of profit. It's telling how ignorant Obama is of America's past, that he doesn't think it's a mistake that he destroyed the most advanced country in Africa, or that he went in at all. Obama's biggest regret is that he didn't go in full force, didn't turn Libya into another Iraq or Afghanistan caught in an endless, unwinnable quagmire. If the most relatively progressive president America has had in decades sees things this way, maybe we should be taking another look at our own so-called civic traditions. And watch the program tonight. Ask yourself this, who do you believe? A dictator's words or your own eyes and ears?